So I thought I would talk today just a little bit about my background in music and in the church, but also how the concepts of purpose and calling have really impacted my story and my life kind of on a daily basis and a yearly basis. And then also just little bits about renewal and how prayer has impacted me. But mostly this is about purpose and calling. And I'm going to tell you some of my story. And I hope it's not a boring story to you, but it, it will tell you about how I came to the places that I am from starting my career as a saxophonist really here in many ways. So I was playing in a public school band, as I told you, and that was kind of the beginning. But now I'm in a place where I'm looking at things from a, a different perspective of years. And so each year I kind of look at, is there something speaking to me in the Word this year that will help grow me forward, that will help inspire me? And the same thing has been speaking to me for two or three years in a row now, and it's from Ephesians 4. And the core part of it that speaks to me is, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And the, the whole verse there is a little more evolved. It says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. But that key line that has stuck for me on a daily basis <clears throat> is to live a life worthy of the calling I've received. So by what path did I get to a sense of even having a calling? You know, from being a saxophonist, playing classical music, uh, even rock music and jazz music to support myself and explore those avenues. How did I get from there to here? So that's kind of the path I want to I want to talk about. How did I get from there to having a sense of an ongoing calling to give my life, my effort, my work, my skills in music and skills in leadership I never knew I had, by the way, uh, to serving with them in a local church and you know, helping others, helping others worship, helping others have an encounter with God that would be healing or that would be changing. Because uh, that's a long road from where I started. And there was actually a seed planted, interestingly enough, at camp meeting uh, in Loudsville. And this was probably 75 or 76. I've never forgotten a song that we sung at camp meeting. Uh, both the words and the melody. I won't, uh, I won't try to sing the melody for you, but, uh, it's, uh, but it's a simple message. It says, do you have a purpose in life? You know there really is none unless you find it in Christ. And I've never forgotten that after all these years, neither the words nor the melody. And I'm not sure that I fully grasped it then, but a seed was, was planted that has since uh, helped to, to bear fruit. So we never know what we do for the next generation in planting a seed, how it's gonna affect them or when it's gonna affect them or how deeply. So since I'm not 14 now, but 61 years young, so I'm also inspired now by another Bible verse I wanted to share from you. Part of Psalm 92 reads, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. So I've been talking to my students for years about staying green and growing uh, throughout their, their lives. You know, uh, of course, with music, there's a wonderful thing that it's not like basketball. We don't have to quit at a certain point or, uh, or, or deteriorate. We can keep continuing to grow and grow. And the same is true of our spiritual walk. So just a little history. I was 13 when I started playing saxophone in the high school band. It was after kind of a two-year career sounding like an injured animal on clarinet in junior <laughs> high school band. And so Charles thankfully changed me to saxophone. And then my second year on it at 14, he said, look, I heard this man play the saxophone at the University of Georgia. He said, I never thought the saxophone was worth anything as a classical instrument, but he changed my mind. He said, would you drive down there and take one lesson with this man? Well, I had to hire my brother to drive me down there uh, because I was 14. And uh, so we went down, I took a lesson, and I heard him play. His name was Buddy Deans. He was a young man. I mean, he was probably 24. I didn't realize how young he was. But when he played, the vision that I saw was heaven had opened up and angels were coming down. That's literally the vision that I saw from what I was hearing. He was an astonishingly beautiful, elegant player. And it turned out a deep Christian man who had a, a deep influence on my life. It kind of became in some ways like a second father to me. But that day, I decided that was my purpose. 
that day, which is crazy, at 14 years old, I decided that what I wanted to do was play the saxophone and teach the saxophone for the rest of my life. I mean, that's kind of a crazy thing to decide at 14, knowing nothing about the difficulties of that world, which are many. Uh, so I made a change in my life. I started quitting playing sports one by one. I stopped watching television, as in I watched one boxing match in seven years, in 1978. That was my television for seven years. And I spent two and a half, three hours a day practicing the saxophone, which is crazy at 14, right? Uh, but this was my sense of purpose that I had gotten at an early age. I'm not gonna say calling, but it was a sense of, of purpose. And it kind of inspired me to keep going. So at 17, I went to college at a conservatory called the North Carolina School of the Arts, which is this wild place full of dancers, drama majors, some of whom you've seen in movies now, were my classmates, uh, visual artists and musicians whose whole life focus was their art. In fact, I would have to say that when we were there, our art became our God. It became our center. It's what we dreamed of. It's what we spent all our time on. It's what we spent all our money on. I stopped going to church because I was working as a waiter on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, Friday night, Saturday night. And then later as a saxophonist four or five nights a week in bars playing nine to one or 10 to two. So a few years of this transpire, and I'm in this musically inspirational and spiritually sort of difficult place and um, sleeping three or four hours a night, we took 13 classes a trimester to give you an example of what a conservatory is like. We were in class eight to eight, and they had told us the day we got there, you won't be able to work while you're here because you'll be in class five days a week for 60 hours. And uh, of course, there were a few of us that had no choice but to work, so we did anyway. So after about three years of this, I uh, uh, had my body rebel on me, and I got extremely ill. I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks with monohepatitis. Didn't know where I was for most of that. Came out of that, got a little better, went back to school for the rest of the year, it was two or three months. Played a concerto with the symphony. I had somehow managed to win the school's concerto competition, which was kind of a big deal, because uh, you were competing against all the genius you know, piano players and violin players that could sit around and practice eight hours a day and that whole deal. So this was a big deal for me. So I got that done, got to the end of the year, and my body just collapsed. I spent the next year in bed, uh, literally, and um, still couldn't get well. Uh, I ran into this situation for the first time in my life that my hard work could not shape the outcome. That nothing that I personally did could shape the outcome of my life, it seemed. So it was a very discouraging point, to put it mildly. And um, I was going to occasionally to a college youth ministry when I could get out and just to get something spiritual. And those guys all put me in the middle of a circle and laid hands on me and prayed for me. And I began to get better. And it took me from 20 to 24 to get well enough to rejoin life. And at 24, I rejoined life as a musician again, not thinking I would do it permanently. My sense of purpose was kind of gone. But I thought, well, here's an opportunity to be a visiting artist for the state, get paid a real salary, get back on my feet, see what happens, see where I should go. So I had a little bit of a second chance, you know. I had kind of lost everything before, you know, love of my life, the whole thing, and now all of a sudden, here's this second chance. And so this was a, a big deal for me to have a second chance. I fell in love again, got engaged, playing the saxophone for a living, found out my body was still not strong. In fact, I ended up diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and, and finally accepting, well, you're probably not ever gonna be like you were at 20 again, so what do you do here? And so I thought, well, I need to change my sense of purpose. I need to do something normal like everybody else, right? Um, I thought that was a bright idea. So at any rate, I tried doing a couple things normal and it didn't really work too well. I uh, got a scholarship to graduate business school at Wake Forest. I stayed a month. Uh, I tried going into speech pathology, lasted a semester, really loved those people, but it wasn't me. So I gave up and said, this must be who God has made me to be. And I should probably accept it. So I went back into music, started getting a graduate degree at Appalachian State in music and teaching, but I had another set of tragedies. Health started giving me problems again, had broken engagement, uh, just ended up feeling lost, feeling uh, you know alone, feeling um, depressed, all that. I don't know if anybody of you have ever had that, but it's a discouraging time. So this was kind of a second discouraging time. I just kind of kept going. 
And I prayed a simple prayer. I found the only simple prayer seemed to really help me. I probably have a simple focus of my mind. So I, I prayed for hope. Nothing else. That was it. And I woke up one morning and I had this realization. I was making a small contribution. The 12 students I was teaching at the college, I was making a contribution to their lives. And then it hit me. Well, maybe life is not about getting what I want. You know, maybe life was about making a contribution instead of getting what I wanted. And so when that simple realization hit me, I quit being depressed. Went back to feeling normal, like I had a purpose again. You know, and the purpose was no longer just playing music to make me happy, but I realized that the purpose was somehow making a contribution. I didn't know how, but it was making a contribution. And um, a young woman knocked on my practice room door one day and invited me to go to church with her on Easter Sunday. I didn't really know her even, you know. Um, I think she was just reaching out, you know. And so I showed up at church at a place called Watauga Christian Center, where I'd never been before, I hadn't been going to church in years. And it felt that day as though the pastor was speaking directly to me. And all of a sudden I got this idea of, wow, God really does need to be at the center of every part of your life. You know, of every decision I make, of, of, uh, of every day, not just Sunday. I never really got that concept in me before, believe it or not. Even after going to church as a young person and committing my life to Christ at 13, had never got that into me, but I did. So I had this sense of recommitment, and I had this sense of gratitude, and I prayed another simple prayer. And what I prayed was that someday I would be allowed to give back to the kingdom, whatever way. Didn't know what that would mean. Didn't know if it would ever happen. Didn't know what that would look like. So I didn't really have my life together. I had just kind of recommitted, starting to really learn about a Christian walk again at 30 years old. It sounds pretty late in the game in some ways, but it's not really. God uses us uh, whenever we say, use me, basically. Um, so I ended up uh, getting a couple of degrees at Appalachian, one in performance and another one in music ed when I was there. And ended up saying, well, why don't I go to Charleston? Because they're offering me a job and it's near the beach and it would be fun to live near the beach. Uh, so I went to Charleston and took a job teaching at a segregated high school outside of Charleston for a year. And um, as soon as I got to Charleston, my body went kerflui. Uh, had a sinus infection, ear infection, bronchitis within three days. And I had a sinus infection for three out of four weeks for 10 months straight while I was teaching band and chorus. So this was a fairly challenging year. And about halfway through the year, I decided I was gonna to go to church the instant that marching season was over. You get a sip of water at the end here. But, uh, so I picked the church out of the phone book that sounded like my church in Boone, and the church was called Seacoast. And I walked in, and I heard sort of a live rock band worship set, and a really simple, humble person get up and give this really simple, humble, but relevant word of God. And I thought, well, I belong here. And so I started attending, started attending a group, and it really kind of helped me get through this difficult year. And every now and then I would sit in with the volunteer worship team and play. And this was kind of a, a bit of a mom and pop deal. The pastor worked there, his wife worked there, there was a janitor. Uh, the music team was a volunteer, this kind of setup. And they had just gotten into a building. They had been in schools and movie theaters and this sort of thing. And um, so at the end of the school year, I was ready to get out because I wasn't feeling too good in Charleston. In fact, I went to an allergist. He said, you can't live here. He said, you can't, you're one of the people that have to leave Charleston. You simply can't live here. There's too many allergies here. It's interacting with your chronic fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. The stress load is too much for your body. Just leave and never come back. And uh, I said, thank you. And that was what I intended to do. So, so Pastor Greg called me into his office at the end of the, toward the end of the year and said, what do you think I should do with my music team? And I said, well, give me till tomorrow. And so I brought him back three pages and said, that's what you need to do with your music team. And he said, well, could I hire you to do that? I said, I don't know. Charleston's making me really sick. I said, let me actually go home and get well and pray about it. And I had a couple of other things that were on the table. I had an offer to go back and do a doctorate in saxophone, right, which sounded interesting and have a teaching assistantship. I had another offer to go on road with a rock musician I know you guys are familiar with, James Brown. 
I had a friend who played with him, and they had a sax player age out at 64. They're like, well, come over and join us in Europe. I'd send them a tape. And I said, well, I'm not going to leave my students in the middle of the year. And they said, well, come join us this summer. And that sounded a little bit interesting, you know, because it's, you know, big name or whatever. So I went home to the mountains and got well and prayed about it. And for the first time in my life, I felt this real sense of strong guidance. It said, this is what you're supposed to do is work in the church. And this is your chance to give back. And so I went to work at the church on my birthday, September 1st, at 34 years old. It feels like a long time to travel through life to find a sense of actual calling. I felt for the first time that I was in a place of calling. Um, so I started working at this church, not really knowing what I was doing in modern worship music, to be honest with you. I just, I knew that I had to build excellence, that there wasn't there. There was a few guys that showed up on Sunday morning and shuffled through a folder and picked out some handwritten tunes and said, let's do this one. And that's what was going on in the worship ministry. And it was heartfelt and good, but my feeling was, let's, you know, why not worship God with the kind of quality that we brought at the conservatory to classical music? Worship music seems even more important. There's healing happening in people's lives. Uh, people's lives are being turned around. There are people like me finding a sense of actual calling, of actual service rather than serving self. There's actual life change going on. Why don't we approach it with that kind of excellence? So I said, well, let's start rehearsing three hours a week with the worship team on Thursday nights. Let's start a choir for the people who can't be in worship team on Monday nights. Let's have a special music team. So instead of somebody singing a solo with the tape, we can actually do it live with the band. Uh, for your Easter plays, let's start having a live, you know, live set of music. Let's actually give people the quality that they deserve. That 2 Samuel tells us, you know, do not bring before the Lord that which cost me nothing. You know? So let's let it cost us something. So they used to say, well, God has a plan for your life, and Robert has a plan for your schedule. And so, so the musicians kind of went with me on that. And so we kind of raised the, the music to a level of excellence that matched the excellence of this humble, quiet teacher that we had. And then I had enough sense to allow the really spirit-filled volunteer worship leaders that we had to do what they needed to do to keep a heart of worship at the absolute center of what we did is an even higher value than the excellence. So the excellence was just a support for the heart of worship. And so with that combination, the church started to grow. Instead of 10% a year, it went from 300 to 800 from September to Christmas, 1500 the next Christmas, 2000, then 3000 by my third year there, I believe, was the size of the church. And at this point, my body rebelled and gave out. And I went home to the mountains for a year and a half. Got well, got stronger, built the cabin that I live in now. And then I called up Greg and I said, Greg, I am dead broke. I said, could you use me back at church? And I feel good again. He said, yeah, come on back. We'll, we'll put you in here. So they had me start a gospel rock choir and start doing some other things. And I ended up with like a 70 voice gospel rock choir and some fun things like that. And so I wasn't doing everything, but started you know, doing some things again. And um, over the years, uh, you know, the church kept growing and morphing in different directions. They ended up starting this deal that everybody does now called multi-site, simply because the town wouldn't let them build a bigger building, so they figured out this multi-site thing. And some other things that ended up being influential. The, God told Pastor Greg, said, you need to start other churches. You know, every community needs a great church, and, and I want you to start 2,000 churches while you're at Seacoast, out of Seacoast. And Greg's kind of like, talks to us, he said, really God, basically, you know? And uh, so he started this thing called the ARC, Association of Related Churches. And uh, so they actually have planted 1,000 churches out of it so far. Some of them a lot bigger than Seacoast. One of them is like 50,000 members and that kind of thing. So, um, so he continued to follow God and I felt inspired by this guy who insisted that he be the lowest paid mega church pastor in America and uh, kept his humility to try myself to do the same with whatever I did in music. So I, again, I prayed a simple prayer when I got on the platform every week. And that simple prayer was simply, let me humbly worship you. And that's the simple prayer I still pray before every service, every time I step up to play an instrument or, or speak or whatever it is. 
So over the years, they gave me different roles. I was sent out in 2006 to Asheville to start a branch of Seacoast, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, as the campus pastor, the founding pastor, and the worship director. And I spent six years uh, with that project, and then was called back to Seacoast to start a school of worship for university students to help create worship leaders for the kingdom of God, basically not just for Seacoast, but for the kingdom of God. Um, so I proceeded to do that for the last eight years of my time at Seacoast. And three of those years, the last three years, uh, we partnered with a Christian university called Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida, so that we could give uh, actual four-year degrees in worship ministry and in pastoral ministry and other areas. And so my role at that point was the pastor of the worship school. And I, uh, when the university wanted us to join up, they did not yet have a contemporary worship degree. They were starting it. And uh, I ended up writing about half of their contemporary worship degree for them at that point. Um, so by this time, I was uh, getting to the point where I was feeling a life change. You know, sometimes we feel a life change or a chapter change. And I felt like it was time for me to go on to another chapter. And I was 60 years old at this point, I write at about 60. And uh, so I uh, retired from Seacoast and the university asked me if I would teach some of these classes online that I had been that I had written for them. So now I teach piano and voice online for them, about 35, 40 students a week during the school year, uh, private lessons just over Zoom. They have little branches of this university at big churches all over America. So I'll have a student from California, Washington State, Montana, and then plenty from the South, of course, and Texas and the Bible Belt. And so that's what I'm doing now, sitting in my cabin in the mountains. And then I migrate out about once a month and play at you know, a church in Charleston, one of our churches or another one, so that I can keep up with the calling that but feel a part of my calling is still playing saxophone for the kingdom. Part of it is helping to bring along the next generation of worship leaders for the kingdom. So I'm able to still do that. And sometimes as we get older, our calling shifts. It may stay in the same area, but it may shift. And I found out that anything that I give to God or surrender to God for long enough is blessed. So if I say, okay, God, I'm going to surrender my talents to you, he blesses them. And we use this Christianese word, anointing which I think is when God shows up and takes our humble offering and makes it more. That's when I feel something is, is anointed. You know, the Holy Spirit in some way shows up, takes our humble offering of music or speaking, whatever, and makes it more than it is. Um, and so that, that happens sometimes as well as a part of our calling. But I also believe that we all have a calling at any stage of life and at any age. Uh, of course, I need to believe that now, but I've always thought that. You know, I'm not sure the Bible really has necessarily a retirement plan. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but, and my mother actually gave me a good example of this. You know, my, my mother uh, uh, was always an encouragement to people, and always from a Christian perspective. She'd been a pastor's wife and a teacher and other things over the years. And when she was older and ended up getting ill in her final illness, uh, I kept her with me for the last 18 months of her life. And I was able to observe her continue this while she was struggling with cancer, heart disease, all these things, pain and pain medication, and continued to write dozens of letters and phone calls to nieces and nephews and cousins and everybody to encourage them. Not to say that I'm sick, but to keep encouraging them, you know, toward the Lord. It's amazing to see. And afterwards, I found one of her journals, and constantly through it was things like, Lord, let me be a light to others today. And I thought, wow. How do you keep fulfilling your calling when you're in that kind of pain that I, that I saw? In fact, I had to pray another simple prayer when I was in that. You know, I'd never cared for somebody before. You know, so I'm caring for somebody, all these physical things you're doing. And I got so tired one night, it was later in the, in the deal, uh, and things were difficult, and I just prayed that simple prayer again. It was kind of just a God help. You know? I don't know if any of you have ever prayed that simple a prayer. And at 3 in the morning, I got a knock on the door of my apartment in Charleston, and it was my cousin Sherry and her daughter Rachel, who both happened to be nurses. And so Sherry and Rachel show up and start helping me. And Rachel stays a few days, Sherry stays the next week until my mother passes. And three days later, a doctor, uh, a woman I had stayed in touch with some, my broken engagement in my 20s, 
showed up and knocked on the door and helped take care of mom for the last few days of life. And uh, so God answers these simple prayers. And that's, that's been amazing to me because I don't ever pray a fancy prayer. They don't help me anyway. But I pray simple prayers. And that simple prayer to allow to give back allowed me to have a calling that's carried me beyond any gift that I have. Uh, God has simply blessed my willingness to serve uh, by putting me in a place to serve far bigger than my gifts or, you know, or anything that I thought I ever had to offer. Uh, so that just when we do our work as though doing it under the Lord, it ends up being blessed. Uh, when we serve others, we serve God. And when we ask to serve, we're allowed to serve. So if anybody's wondering, I had a woman this week talking to me. She said, I don't know what my calling is, but I know it's something. She's close to my age. And I saw a couple things in here, and I said, have you thought about these things? And she said, well, that's pretty exciting. I need to look into that, you know, mentoring and some things like that, you know. So there is a calling for all of us, and I'm still trying now to remain green and growing in what is called old age. But I think this old age that I'm supposedly in is actually a season of sharing with the next generation, much of it. But then not stopping what we're called upon to share, too. So I hope I'll keep doing this as long as, you know, I still have some teeth or whatever, you know, but, uh, or I'll find some that'll help. So, but, so I think that this time in life is equally blessed to the time when we're young and, um, or maybe more so at some times. Um, so I kind of urge everybody to just continue to be inspired to live a life worthy of the calling that you've been given. And if you don't feel like you have a calling, ask God for one and you'll get it. Maybe two or three of them. Be careful what you ask for. So I want to share with you as I close a verse that we posted at the School of Worship. It's Romans verse 1 and 2. I like it in the message version. I don't know if you guys like the modern one, but occasionally it really hits a home run. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and you'll be changed from the inside out. Let's take a minute and just pray as, as I close today. God, just renew our hearts and minds. Just renew our sense of calling, our sense of purpose, and give us a clearer sense of calling if that's needed. Just help us to surrender to you. Help us to surrender our work to you, our gifts, our strength, and every year of our life to you, God. And we ask that you bless those efforts in Jesus' name.